Hey guys, uh, what's this one going to be about? Well, since it's such a somber occasion and uh, the ringleader here of the, the Subaru gang, uh, a very nice lady online, uh, she was the community organizer, at least one of them, and uh, well, the head of the organization, and well, Everybody knows that uh, women are the smarter of us most of the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, I don't know the cause for her passing. But the two things that are of a huge influence in the society right now, we're talking 2023, uh, especially after COVID and especially during COVID, are, are suicide and cancer. Yeah. And having like personal core and say personal relationship the, the, with it within six degrees of separation of people in my family dying from cancer or, you know, um, self harm, you know, because, uh, drug addictions or alcoholism and even gambling or, uh, yeah, let's just keep it there are causes of stress that lead to like actual cellular de degradation and uh this means that your your immune system again being coming from an amateur standpoint and i'm more or less examining this from a historical perspective because that's what i know and you know there's more than enough information and, and medical experts that will support what i'm saying to a degree that they 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 have uh you know experience with uh so okay moving on um you know as i just put on instagram you know obviously i'm not happy about it and it, it angers me it really does you know because you know suicide and cancer are both preventable conditions and they're both uh you know uh, you know they both start with a lifestyle choice uh what and lifestyle choices you know nutrition uh, and then there's some other factors like, uh, you know, uh, exposure to environmental contamination uh, and so on and so forth. The next one being the, the stress level. Again, these are all continuous themes that I'm trying to communicate with, uh, with the history of propaganda because these are the means by which it make us vulnerable and make us exploitable. Uh, then, okay, so another one would be uh, hormones and uh yeah we'll just keep it there at the, the hormones so i'm staring at the research and statistics of suicidepreventionca and one in ten it says here this is right on the uh, right, right out in the open today in canada 10 people will end their lives by suicide up 200 times up to 200 others will attempt so and i've been around someone when i was working for staples here in London, uh, delivering to all, uh, many different offices and, and government buildings, even the London Police Service, by the way. How you doing, guys? I've been in the back door. Do you know that? This is not a threat. Uh, obviously, I'm trustworthy because I've been bonded in the past. And I don't, being, don't appreciate being treated like a criminal, you know? And that's the thing, is that uh, Abuses of power induce stress states, and it's not the fault of the cops because the cops are not necessarily educated in these things. They're they're just more or less having to deal with so much stress that uh, you know that uh, the stress also leads to psychosis, right? Where you're not exactly you know okay dopamine burnout and serotonin even serotonin burnout or cortisol burnout, and you get rising levels. And then associated with maladaptive coping mechanisms of, uh, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction. So what can I say from, from an amateur standpoint and from a historian standpoint, this is the data. We're going to go forward with that. Uh, today in Canada. Okay. So for each, each death by suicide, the world health organization estimates 10 people are deeply affected. So suicide is not painless. It brings on many changes and it causes more harm to the people around you than anything else. You know, uh, especially if you don't have, 
you don't have a support system, I can understand why people want to go through with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a good family and that they do support me in this, in, in this moment where I'm completely destitute with my finances because of, uh, because of the last two contracts that I, I had in the past in, in 2022 in the fall fell through because I stood up for myself and I said, no, I'm not going to be allow my, allow myself to be abused and, and to, to go against the dirty dozen, you know, fatigue being number one, just because I wanted to spend more time with my family and because they would not respect me, right? Having self-respect is very important and what and is, and you know, having, having self-esteem, you know, and having a good, uh, self-image, self-efficacy is what will prevent you from committing suicide. Because there's many different forms of suicide. You know, there's social suicide, there's financial suicide, and those are the two ones that I can think of right now. Um, uh, and then there's there's physical suicide. Take that for what you think it is. So, you know, okay, beyond these people, up to 100 additional people will also affect, will be also be affected by the death. According to Statistics Canada, between 2014 and 2018, there were an average of 4,121 suicides per year, which means over 400,000 people bereaving suicide loss each year. Even more people are suffering from suicidal thoughts. Example, in 2015, over 3,396,000 Canadians aged 12 and over had suicide-related thoughts and behaviors. To a certain, actually, to be certain, suicide is a critical public health issue in Canada. I agree, it really is, because there's just not societal support because we live in a psychopathic society, right? By definition, the corporation is suicide. Uh, sorry, by 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 cor uh, sorry, by definition, the, the corporation is psychopathic, right? Like, if you want to learn more about that, you go to the documentary called The Corporation. And, uh, you know, it's a real eye opener. There's, there's, as I said in other videos, there's industries out there that profit off of our suffering. And they, they exist to leech and be parasites off of the, the human condition. And it's not your fault. The fact, the fact that you want to, you, you feel these things and you, and you think these things and you think that there's no way out, but there is, you need to, you need to ask for help. You need to drop the ego and then you need to find, you know, more, uh, productive ways to prevent any further harm to yourself and your family or, or your friends because you know the traumas you know the heart the heartache the heartbreak uh, let's see um, so heartbreak and bereavement uh, so okay we're gonna go with psychnet.apa.org So this is off of PsychNet. Uh, this was written in 2011. And this is just the abstract, right, for, for brevity's sake. Uh, the literature review suggests that romantic breakups may lead to bereavement symptoms, including intrusive thoughts and attempts to suppress them, and insomnia, as well as morbidity factors, including broken heart syndrome and Im immune dysfunction. Although the broken heart syndrome has mimicked real heart attacks, angiograms reveal that no clogged arteries or permanent heart damage exist. Compromised immune function may result from reduced vagal uh, activity and increased cortisol and cardio. I don't know how to say that. Cardioalmines, so C A T E C H O L A M I N E S, uh, cardioalmines, uh, leading to increased inflammatory. Uh, Cyt cyt cytokines uh, and decreased natural killer cell activity. I don't know exactly what that means. I'll have to look it up. Uh, the model proposed here is that the romantic breakups result in a loss of a person uh, as a regular as a regulator of stimulation and arousal modulation that can lead to these physiological and biochemical effects. These uh, data highlights the complexity of romantic breakups, heartbreak, and bereavement, and the need for multivariable research on these symptoms be both before and after the breakups occur. So what that really has to correlate to is there's a chemical that's called oxytocin. And oxytocin is the bonding chemical. 
uh, and it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's released at the, at, at the highest rate within the first year of the relationship. And thereafter, it, it peters off because it has to do with uh, stimulation of reproduction. You know, you, that's the whole love, uh, high on love, you know, it makes you, it makes you crazy. And thereafter, it's like coming down from, you know, Oxycontin because it's addictive. It is supposed to be. It's, it's a natural function in order, in order for, for pair bonding and also for, for bonding of uh, mother to child, right? Because oxytocin is released just after birth. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's released upon human contact. So if you go to hug someone, uh, this is, again, this is scientific from what I remember. Uh, the oxytocin is, re is released after 30 seconds. So when you go to hug someone and you like them, don't be afraid to hold them for a while. Because that's what it means to keep in touch with them. Right? Skin-to-skin -skin contact is very important with, uh, with babies. It's absolutely the highest priority. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of intrusiveness in modern medicine that gets in the way of that. And that's why I support, I support midwives because it's the immediate contact. The child, the child was just inside the woman. Like it's going to be cold as, as all else, you know, like hold on to it as, as best and best and as quickly as possible. All right. Um, again, I don't say all these things and my knowledge, I hope it doesn't terrify you, but you know, again, I've been in front of a computer and on the internet since 1997 and I, I feel this is my duty to go forth with this history of propaganda because it's so important. I believe in it and I hope you do too, because you know, this, this, this is an endemic, you know, and, uh, what happened with COVID, this was all well documented with the, the loneliness. Here's another part. So let's go with the effects of loneliness. Uh, scholarly articles for effects on loneliness. Uh, okay, so let's go to uh, cdc.gov. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Okay, so again, this is it, loneliness really affects the older generations because they don't know they don't know or understand uh, to to the degree that the younger generations do, and not to write them off. Um, the function and the usefulness and the uh, the effectiveness of the human network that is the internet now, especially with with how how quick and easy, right? The bandwidth. That's what that's what that's what really what I was waiting for, and you know how how because like I remember and from personal account here, trying to show people uh, back in 2013 or so in, in the London art community here, uh, using my phone like an online gallery. And, you know, trying to, to get some, uh, some actual networking going, meeting people in person. That was of utmost priority because all of my best relationships started from meeting someone in person, not through a screen, not through a keyboard. I hate this now. I, I absolutely despise it. You know, I spent way too much time in front of a computer to just, you know, self-isolate now. And the only reason why I'm in this, this position right now is because I don't have the resources and I need your help to continue this mission because I've asked for help multiple times from different agencies and I get ignored and I get ignored and I get ignored because people are intimidated by intelligence and they don't want to be, you know, embarrassed. Cause that's, the, that's a matter of fact, that's the ego, right? How did this one kid from London, Ontario, that grew up in Barrie come to know so much information about the world and, and, and human existence? Because I did the work. I did the work. And you need to do the work too. You know, young people are a lot smarter than what we give them credit for. And, you know, that's why, why young people, you know, okay, so let's go back to this, uh, research and statistics, a, a depression and suicidal ideation amongst Canadians aged 15 to 24, uh, 15 to 24 year olds have the highest rates of mood and anxiety disorders of all, all age groups. This is a PDF. So we'll read the statistics report. About 7% of them were identified as having had depression in the past 12 months compared to the 5% of people aged 24, actually 25 to 64, and 2% of those aged 65 and older. 
So open this up. This is from Statistics Canada. It was released in January 18th, 2017 by Leanne Findlay. So a very caring person to put this together. Thank you. Okay, so let's read the abstract uh, for brevity's sake, because again, I'm going to keep these under, try to keep these under 45 minutes to, to a half hour because of how much information I'm packing into just, just these one videos, or just these, sorry, these individual videos. Okay, so background. Among Canadians aged 15 to 24, the rate of depression is higher than any other age, and suicide is the second leading cause of death. The current study provides detailed information about depression and suicidal ideation, among young Canadians, including their use of mental health support. So what does ideation mean? Uh, the formation of, of ideas and concepts. So ideation, ideology, something like that, right? Idea, the idea, the, the inception, right? The creation. Because everything starts with an idea. And this, and this whole thing, history of propaganda, started with an idea. What can I do to change things? Because I'm tired of listening to people kill themselves and hurt themselves and all the stories of people of self-harm across the country, across the country from, from sea to sea. You know, I haven't been up north, but I know that with the natives up there, the, uh, uh, oh geez, I'm, uh, it's, it's missing. Mm, crap. Okay. So anyways. I want to call them Eskimos, but that's offensive. <laughs> anyway, there we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, memory, memory association. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit embarrassed here. Uh, okay. It's very high amongst them because they don't feel that they have uh, options and they can't find mates. And so and they're like, why am I still alive? I, I remember... When I was in Greenland at, in Kulasuk, and this one woman was losing her mind on the porch of like the common house, uh, and uh, the old the, the staff house, and people lived there, and obviously a bit further away from the main settlement, and there's also a, a lodge there, right, uh, for tourists. So as I you know I've, I've linked this on on my Instagram, I really encourage you to go to Kulasuk. You know, those people, they love, they love visitors. And I think you'll enjoy it there too. Uh, okay. So uh, let's go with the, the data and the methods. Data from the 2012 Canadian Community Health Survey, Mental Health, CCHS-MH, were used to describe rates and experiences of depression and suicidal ideation among Canadians aged 15 to 24, including psychosocial characteristics of those who had depression or reported suicidal thoughts. Characteristics associated with seeking professional support were also examined. Uh, the results? About 11% of Canadians aged 15 to 24 had experienced depression in their lifetime, 7% in the past year. Approximately 14% uh, reported having suicidal thoughts in their lifetime, 6% in the past year. Uh, lifetime depression and suicidal thoughts were moderately correlated. Individuals with lifetime depression had more than four times the odds of seeking professional support in the previous year compared with those who did not have lifetime depression. Those with lifetime suicidal thoughts had more than three times the odds. Oh, wait, sorry, I'm repeating, repeating. Uh, that did not uh, whoops, have uh, a psychosocial factors such as negative social interactions blah, 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 were associated. Uh, with depression and suicidal thoughts, although these associations differ from males and females. Uh, interpretation. The findings suggest that many young Canadians have depression and or suicidal thoughts. Their odds of seeking professional support are significantly high. Uh, so, you know, the system becomes overloaded. There's not enough time between each, each one of these, these psychotherapists or these psychologists or sociologists even. Uh, to, to even give them the attention that is required. But, you know, what causes that? You know, why would, why would so many young people want to harm themselves? 
And, you know, uh, it, through cross analysis and correlation, uh, not causation, uh, that uh, bullying it, and, uh, let's see, and ost social ostracization from, from a young age uh, as uh, with determining factors such as income, and family structure, so single parenthood, you know, and not having proper role models or having any 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 central belief system. So not having, you know, religion or or something larger, it's no no community uh, connection. Because right? this is this has happened progressively with uh, the adoption of social media. You know, the the double, double edged sword. Uh, by my guess, you know, social media was created to uh, you know, obviously to connect people and and then the dark side is is that it became a method of collecting data on people uh, you know it's uh things get corrupted they get corrupted from their original forms uh, okay so moving on from this uh, you know, cause like there's, there's different ways to use propaganda, you know, uh, the, the, what, and what's the more factors that, that leads to, to suicide. The ones that I can think about with self-harm and so forth have to do with body image and young women and this, this idealization, idealization of, of the human body, right. And the fashion. So that again, correlating to, to body dressing in that, you know, um, uh, women, we're always looking, and also men, looking at the at the marketing, you know, uh, you know, you, the models and so forth, and then the airbrushing, the photoshopping, and the reduction of, of curves, or, or you know, increasing certain things, certain certain properties, and then and then the increase of uh, pharmaceutical availability and, and pushing, with the the paybacks, that occur with doctors and the medical industrial complex for for prescribing these things. You know, because that's that's a means of corruption, an over prescription of, of, of these medications. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, I'm thinking about it, because this was described by Adbusters, right, and having to do with um, the problem of too much medication and too much advertising mixed with. Uh, like this is correlation. I'm not going to say it's a direct cause. You know, correlation correlation is not causation. Because uh, uh, what cause what causes the death? What is is the result? Is the actual? Uh, that's the cause of suicide. You know, these are these are the, the 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 chain is the chain from one end of the galaxy to the other, right there, and then you have the meteor meteor meteorotic. <laughs> meteoric, meteoric occurrence, right? Uh, what's another cause is molestation or sexual assault. You know, that can happen um, very often within families or that, that happen to have taken in, uh, say, uh, post-divorce, a stepfather or a stepmother and differential treatment between, between the, uh, the genetic child and the adopted one. You know the the half child, and so on and so forth. These are these these are all determining factors, right? In, in the psychology, in family psychology. And again, feel free to correct me because I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur. I'm just collecting all this data as much as I can. Uh, holy, right? Holy, eh? That's a lot of information, hey? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. How'd you how'd you get all this in your head, hey? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just sat in front of a computer for fucking twenty three years, hey? <laughs> Oh goodness, oh goodness, longer than that. Uh... Just gotta think about this for a second and let you catch up. We're at 24 minutes now. This is a lot to think about.
I stand on the shoulders of giants. That's what I have to say. There's a lot of doctors and researchers out there that have collected this information and put it into papers, white papers, and they put it on the radio, say like white coat, black art. Uh, and uh, I'm forever thankful. So this is why I'm doing it. Because if it doesn't get out there, it'll just keep happening. You know, so since we're on, on the topic of suicide, and you know, okay, so uh, the marketing, right? Uh, Edward Bernays, uh, that's the century of self. And how does that influence? How does that influence suicide? The Century of the Self. That's a 2002 documentary. It's about an hour long. It was uh, produced in Britain. It focuses on the work of psychoanalytics Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud and Pierre consultant Edward Bernays. Now, Edward Bernays was, um, uh, was Freud's nephew, if I remember correctly. Edward Bernays was born to he was born in Vienna to a Jewish family. His mother Anna, 1858-1955, was Sigmund Freud's sister, and his father Eli was the brother of Freud's wife, Martha Bernays. Uh, yeah, was the brother of Freud's wife, Martha Bernays. Their grandfather, Isaac Bernays, was the chief rabbi of Hamburg and a relative of the poet Henrich Heine. Heine. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The Bernays family moved from Vienna to the United States in the 1890s after Eli Bernays started working as a grain exporter at the Manhattan Produce Exchange. He sent for his wife and children. In 1892, his family moved to New York, moved to New York City where Bernays attended DeWitt, De, De, DeWitt Clinton High School. In 1912, he graduated from Cornell University with a degree in agriculture but chose journalism as his first career. He married Dorothy uh, Fleshman, Flesh, Fleshman in 1922. Fleshman was a member of the Lucy Stone League, a group of which encountered women, sorry, which encouraged women to keep their names after marriage. Well, that's uh, that's that uh, you know. As an aside, uh, with with uh, Judaism, it's more matriarchal. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more matriarchal in 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 their their group relation. So adverse to, to North American or Christian uh, tradition where it's more, uh, more masculine. However, she changed her mind and her name, becoming Doris Bernays. By all accounts, Fleshman played a major, ma played a major through, played a major, what? A major, what? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, played a major through quiet role in the Bernays public relations business. Uh, that, that grammar is terrible, including ghostwriting, numerous memos and speeches, and publishing a newsletter. So you see, this is why you don't trust Wikipedia, is because it's, it's, it's edited all the time, frequently. It's the battlefield of intellectualism. Okay, going forth. Okay, so notable clients and campaigns. Bernays used Sigmund Freud's uh, ideas to help convince the public, among other things, that bacon and eggs was the true all-American breakfast. In the 1930s, his Dixie Cup campaign was designed to convince consumers that only disposable cups were sanitary by linking the image of an overflowing cup with subliminal images of a genitalia and venereal disease. Political cl uh, political clients. Okay. Uh, in 1924, Bernays set up a, a vaudeville pancake breakfast for Calvin Coolidge to change his stuffy image prior to the 1924 election. So, President Coolidge. So, he was the 30th president... Uh, of the United States from 1923 to 1929. 
so, you know, you have the Roaring Twenties and then you have the Dirty Thirties. The Dirty Thirties were, uh, you know, it was depression in the United States. And in the Twenties, it was excess and, uh, and degeneracy, honestly, you know, uh, where all of these, these behaviors were out in the open. And just people were just high on cocaine or, or opium all the time and drinking and stuff like that. That's why they had prohibition. Uh, because it was uh, alcoholism in the 19th century was a huge problem. You know, it, it came, it, it, you know, a drinking beer used to be a uh, English tradition because the water was contaminated. There was, they didn't have means of purifying the water so that they, they, the alcohol would purify the water and you wouldn't have bacterial contamination. You wouldn't get sick with like diphtheria or whatever. Dysentery. Um... Amoebas, uh, flus, and so on and so forth. Anything that was communicable because of the, the alcohol content. And because, you know, liquid liquid breakfast, right? Drinking a beer before. That's a, that's an English another English tradition. And, and German, even. Um, European. Uh, drinking a beer before going to work. A low alcohol content at, at room temperature. Okay, next one. Uh, a desperate Herbert Hoover consulted with Bernays a month before the 1932 presidential election. Bernays advised Hoover to create disunity within his opposition and, prevent, and present an image of him as an invincible leader. The 1932 uh, presidential election was between Roosevelt and, and Hoover. And obviously Hoover lost and Roosevelt was put into power. But Hoover, Hoover got himself a, a different position. You know, I like the Hoovers. I do. Okay, uh, next, uh, Bernays advised William O'Dwyer and his can candidacy for mayor of New York City on how to appear in front of different demographics. For example, he should tell Irish voters about his actions against the Italian Mafia and the Italian voters about his plans to reform the police department. <laughs> See, he was the first madman, you know, uh, the, what's it, the spin doctor. He, he helped found the, you know, there, of course, advertising existed at the beginning of the, of the 20th century and before that with newspapers and so forth, but it was very Spartan, right? It was just very, very functional, uh, and very utilitarian. And then they started associating, um, products with lifestyles and identities. And so that's, uh, if I'm going to jump forward uh, quite a bit, because, you know, I, to examine the 21st century, sorry, the 21st century and then the 20th century in the frame of, you know, the history of propaganda is going to take a while, right? I'm re I'm really want to concentrate on, on the here and now so that you have a, a correlation and a, a foundation to go forward into the internet and figure this stuff out for yourself, because I can't tell you everything. I really can't. I don't have all the time in the world. I got paintings to finish. I got day-to-day -day things to do. You know, I got to exercise. I can't make this uh, my, my, my one and only obsession or fixation. Okay, uh, even further. Oh, tobacco. <laughs> That's a good one, eh? Uh, you know, if you remember, there used to be a time where, where tobacco was thought to, to be healthy, you know? And there was uh, all of this within cinema and, you know, subjected, su uh, subliminal programming uh, through suggestion or just by, by showing it. Uh, 1927, Bernays worked briefly for Liggett's and Mayers, makers of Chesterfield cigarettes. 
he pulled the stunt against the competing brand, Lucky Strike, which involved making the endorsements of opera singers who said Lucky Strike were kind to your voice. Uh, George Washington Hill, head of the American Tobacco Company, uh, made Lucky Strike, uh, promptly hired Bernie's away from Liggett, uh, say, which made Lucky Strike, promptly hired Bernie's away from Liggett and Myers. And Myers. So when he stated work, started working for American Tobacco Company, Bernays was given the objective of increasingly lucky, so increasing uh, lucky strike sales among women, excuse me, who, were, who for the most part had form, formally avoided smoking. The first strategy was to persuade women to smoke cigarettes instead of eating. Bernays began by promoting the idea of thinness itself, using for, photographers, artists, newspapers, and magazines to, to promote the special beauty of thin women. Medical authorities were, were found to promote the choice of cigarettes over sweets. Homemakers were cautioned that keeping cigarettes on hand was a social necessity. You see, propaganda to sell a product, to, to, to you know, eat at the insecurities. And I've mentioned this before, you know, uh, propaganda works first uh, and the most uh, vigorously against women and children. Uh, men don't fall for this stuff as easily as, you know, as far as I can tell, you know, by my, by my assessment, you know, by, by this, this stupid person's assessment. Okay. Um. So that's a good interlude to uh, what causes cancer, right? With the cigarettes, that's a, since that's a well well known touchstone to move from. Okay, so this is this is from the Canadian Cancer Society. You can go look it up, cancer.ca. Uh, very few cancers have a single known cause. Many cancers seem to, seem to be caused by a complex mix of many risk factors, but sometimes cancer develops in people who don't have any risk factors at all. A risk factor is any substance or condition that increases the risk of developing cancer. Cancer risk factors may play different roles in starting cancer and helping it grow. Examples of risk factors for cancer include getting older, smoking, not protecting yourself from the sun, having certain genetic changes, being overweight or obese, not having a healthy diet, not getting enough physical activity, drinking alcohol, coming into contact with harmful chemicals or at work, and having certain types of infections. So basically it's anything that, that leads to, to uh, DNA degradation, right? Uh, anything, and the thing is, is that if I remember correctly, uh, that you, your, your body refreshes itself with every cell every seven years. Uh, so you're not the same person that you were seven years ago because it's you, you obviously that that's living right it, the cells cells you know are are created and then they die they created and then they die um let's so, so let's go to mitochondrial diseases 